Have you ever wondered what it would take to upgrade to a top tier long travel setup? Today I'm going to walk through a cambered kit that has been abused on my truck for five years and miraculously has had no failures. We're going to go through the components, the fabrication, the maintenance, and of course the detail everyone wants to know, how much did it actually cost? Even if you're looking at a different long travel kit from another manufacturer like Dirt Kings or LSK, or you even have a different type of truck like a Ford Raptor or Chevy or something, this is still a very good crash course on long travel systems and will help you go through some of the considerations you need to think about if you want to run one on your truck. Okay, so the first question that we've got to get answered is why do people even do this to their vehicles? The obvious answer is they're doing this to have more travel in their truck. But the bigger side of it, and probably the side that gets expensive, is not just having more travel in your truck, it's actually having a lot more control of that travel. Let me show you what I mean real quick. So if you look at this system, the stock system on a Tundra is gonna give you about eight inches of travel. This system is going to give you around 16. So you're almost doubling your travel on the front end of your truck, which is huge. You're also making your truck about two and a half inches wider on each side. So about a five inch wider track, which gives you a lot more control when you're headed into those turns really fast. Uh, if we jump over here to the rear of the truck, this suspension system in the rear of the truck is actually giving you a full 16 inches of travel, depending on how you have it set up can get a little more, a little less. This is set up for the little bit less setup right now. We'll cover that in a second. Okay, going back over here to the front, let's go ahead and jump into the components so you can understand what do you have to put into here to be able to get this level of travel and this level of control. Right off the bat, you're gonna notice there's not just one shock here, a coilover like the factory truck. There's two shocks. The second shock is what gets you all of that control. The longer stroke on all this stuff and the way the, a the lower arms and upper arms are set up is what gives you the additional travel. But this is the brains of the outfit. So this is a triple bypass piggyback shock. When it's called a piggyback, it's because the external reservoir, rather than like this one being on the end of a hose for the coilover, this one is just straight on the shock body. So. This is your brains. You can control your compression and rebound on this. This is how you can keep your system from bottoming out and doing a lot of adjustments there, even without having to utilize your bump stops. In order to put that on here, you know, there's not a normal mount up here for it. So you have to buy one of these. Camberg makes these. This is a hoop that goes across the top over to your normal shock mount. It gives you the ability to add the second shock. On this side, it needs to be welded into place. Back behind this shock, there is another leg that also reinforces it to hold it, that is also welded in place. Um, it's bolted on up top, so it just bolts there. Uh, so that's your hoop for your sh secondary shock, your secondary shock. You obviously have an aftermarket Fox Race Series shock here as well, so much bigger and longer uh, than the one that your truck normally comes with has the external reservoir. External reservoirs are all about managing your heat. So as you put a lot of work on this and go very, very fast through whoops and washboard and things like this, this keeps your shock performing at a high level rather than overheating your shock and having the performance drop. This also is an adjustable shock. Then we jump over to the actual kit that makes this all possible. So this is your upper control arm. This one, this is the only difference in this kit, just so you guys know, because this is a five-year-old kit. This is the third generation of it. Um, to make the kit a little more affordable, uh, they have the hollow tube upper control arm now has gussets instead of these heim joints. These are heims. Heim joint gives a little bit more performance, 
um, but they also have a billeted upper control arm. So the billeted now comes with the Heim, the tube comes with bushings, a little less performance, but definitely a cheaper price point. Um, other than that, it's gonna look the same as this. It's gonna have these big old ball joints on the top, which are what gives you that ability for this whole system to hit those crazy angles when it's going up and down. There's also a ball joint down here on the bottom on this lower control arm. You will notice right here that there's nothing there. That is actually for a sway bar. You can get an aftermarket sway bar system from Camberg. Um, I don't really recommend it. This system works fine on the freeways and all your cornering. I've never had big issues with body roll as long as you have all this stuff adjusted correctly. If you're on the freeway, gonna do a ton of freeway driving, you can always harden up your shock, stiffen it up a little bit and works great. That is about an $1,800 add-on if you get all the other stuff for the sway bar. It's an option. I don't use it. Additional stuff on here, axle. I told you this is gonna get two and a half inches wider on each side to be able to accommodate the, the more travel. In order to do that, they have to extend your axles. So they sell these extended axles. They are chromoly axles. They're actually stronger than the factory ones. This one's been in here for five years of abuse and I've actually never broken it, which is a kind of an amazing feat because this thing has been rock crawled in Moab it's been in Baja a bunch of times. It's been on a lot of overland trips. And that's kind of one of the main things you break when you get into that rough stuff. So I can definitely vouch for the fact that they're pretty strong. You can see my boot is leaking down here. That's not really the fault of this system. That's just 100,000 miles of abuse. You're gonna end up with a loose boot. And I'm about to tear all this out, sand it all down, repowder coat it, and uh, service both the CVs. So it'll all be fine. That's the main maintenance that I've done after five years. I haven't revalved the shocks once. They do recommend that you revalve these about every year to year and a half. So we're kind of doing a durability, or I guess I would call it a torture test. And I'm amazed by how well all of this has performed. Beyond that, to facilitate this front end, you're gonna notice there is a cap mount chop, so that's chopped. Then they weld a plate back onto it. Um, to, to give you more room here. This kit actually moves your whole tire one inch forward to give you clearance in the rear for 37s. You're gonna notice there is no liner in here. Uh, that's just because it's all taken out right now and everything's coming out and getting cleaned up. But I will put a fender liner back in here when I am done to uh, keep dirt from getting into my headlights and everything like that. But lots of chopping was done in here, lots of cutting to clearance this all out. Uh, the fender liner is not a part that anybody sells. You pretty much have to make that custom with a heat gun in this plastic um, because depending on how you fit your tires, everybody's fender, li fender liner ends up being a tiny bit different. You will notice some rub marks up here. So this is where I have actually been able to get my tire all the way up to touch here. It doesn't actually happen very often. What When that happens, it's because I'm usually running my triple bypass super soft for normal basic trails. And then I go and get into some heavy stuff without climbing out and adjusting that shock. There's two ways to solve it. Always get out and adjust your shock, which is super easy to do before you go into the heavy stuff, or you can do a little bit of work on the factory bump, taking this off, putting in a longer one and getting it dialed to where it gives you the exact amount of movement to protect you up there. Um, I'll probably end up doing that when I have all this off. Um, but yeah, that's just the boring old factory bump stop right there. Um, beyond that, I think we've covered everything in the front end except for one other modification that you have to make. We're looking at the driver's side right now. Um, it's only on the passenger side that this modification has to be made. So if we jump over here, same kit, obviously. This blue and red looking stuff is part of your engine breather kit. Your engine breather usually sits back a little bit over here and it would get in the way of the travel for this big of tires. So that has to be relocated forward. Camber has the kit for all of that to be able to do that as well. Up here, you're gonna notice that's your air intake. If you don't have a fender liner at all, you're going to be wrecking your air filter. So fender liner does need to go back in to protect that or you're gonna have to put on something like a snorkel, um, which brings us to the last component that has to be changed to make room for this kit, your fenders. These aren't the factory fenders, these are fiberglass. They bump four inches out on the side 
to allow clearance for that full travel of your tire to be able to stuff. The downside of that is the easiest answer to your air intake is to stick a snorkel. Every snorkel that is made for this is made for a standard fender. So the normal snorkel kits out there won't work. You have to go with a custom snorkel. It's not a bad idea because if you're putting a kit on this, it's probably because you want to go do some high speed stuff in the desert. And snorkels, as much as everybody thinks they're for water, they're primarily for dust. Okay, so moving on to the back of the truck. This is a lot quicker back here, a lot less convoluted. Again, same thing. Got fenders back here that are fiberglass, so you have to cut off your original bedside, the side of it. Put on these. It's not actually that crazy to do. Feels crazy to do it, but it's not that hard to do, I guess is what I should say. Back here, you've got a leaf sprung kit. You've got a bump stop. You've got this big triple bypass shock. This is a 16 inch Fox triple bypass. You can see that there is holes cut into the bed and it goes up through the bed to over here. That's the top of the shock. It's almost level with the top of the bedside. This is a bed cage that's modular. It's made to fit back here. It bolts onto the frame. So no real fabrication other than cutting holes. Um, it's very sturdy, braces the shocks on both sides. So you got one here, one over there. Coming down, they come down and they mount onto your axle at new mounting points. So this has to be welded on. This is your old mounting point. You could cut these off if you don't want them hanging down low. But in reality, if you're gonna stick this big of a shock with a 16 inch throw on it, you actually shouldn't be running this leaf pack. You'd wanna be running a leaf pack that goes under your axle. So when I'm cleaning all this up, I'll be switching over to the undermounted or undersprung leaf. The reason is this has a long enough throw to give me more travel, down travel, than I have available right now with the way my leaf springs run. This leaf pack came with the truck. It was a great one. It's an aftermarket one from Deaver. Highly recommend it. If you're not going to go with a bed cage, you still want to do long travel, but you're going to use your factory mount location. By the way, look at that. That's the factory mount location for a shock that's squarely hitting in the middle of this shock. Gives you an idea of how much more travel you're getting out of this system. But um, if you are gonna stick with that, you can. There is kits for triple bypass shocks off of there. And then you would stick with the, the, the over because you wouldn't have a long enough throw to utilize an undersprung kit. You're gonna be changing out your shackles in the rear. You're gonna be changing out your springs. Uh, in the case of going undersprung, this little piece you see here, gonna get a new one of those flipped around to the bottom and that whole thing flips around to the bottom. Uh, some people freak out about that because they say it's going to ruin your clearance. The reality is it's not going to stick down any lower than your old factory mount for shocks. So it's not really messing up your clearance that much. It's also very close to your tire where you have the 37s. So you're probably going to be more worried about hitting your pumpkin than you are hitting the bottom of your leaf pack. If you do hit the bottom of your leaf pack, the reality is it can handle quite a bit of abuse. So you're probably fine. If you look at this frame that's holding this shock, you can see it's bolted into the bed right here. And then down in this little crack right here, it's bolted in right there. Again, no fender liner in here. Gonna have to fabricate that out of some plastic with a heat gun. Uh, it's a good idea to do it because if you leave it like this and you throw rocks directly up here into your fiberglass, you will ruin your fiberglass over time. If you want to take a look at that bed cage from the back of the truck, it actually goes up pretty far against the bed. So you really don't use, lose a lot of space. Um, there's a perfect amount of space between the metal and the back of the thing to store like some jerry cans, some tools, traction boards. It, it actually works out pretty well at not losing too much room in the bed. The problem is you have holes in the bed and dust kicks up on here and I've got a shell on it. So I'm actually making some aluminum boxes to fully encase this and the whole entire shock to not li limit the ability for it to move when it's articulating, but to seal the dust out of the back of my bed. So when I'm down in Baja, I don't have to have a blower, blow everything off every time I go to set up camp. Oh, you know what we didn't talk about real quick? is these bump stops. No fabrication, these brackets for it 
Cambrig makes them, they bolt on. Uh, this is a two inch bump stop from Fox. This keeps you from bottoming out your shock back here, it works great, and you do have to extend your brake lines. So that pretty much covers the rear end of the truck. So there you have it. That is the kit. Those are all the components. Additional things that you could add to this kit if you wanted to somehow spend even more money is there is an aftermarket much stronger spindle from Camberg because um, this now is a weak point in your whole entire build because everything else has been beefed up. Um, I've run the factory one for five years, never managed to break it, but you can get an aftermarket one that bolts straight on. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> it's so beefy, uh, but I've managed to make it work without it quite well. Okay, so that basically covers the whole entire system. After this, I'm going to jump back over to the screen and I will break down the cost of each one of these components for you. So here we go, let's go do that. Okay, so some final thoughts on long travel systems. Obviously, these things are very expensive. At almost $20,000 just in parts for an elite long travel system, you are going to be making a major investment in your truck. A couple things to consider. One is I didn't actually buy all those components. I actually owned a gray Tundra that I wanted to put long travel on, and I was able to find this white Tundra that already had it installed. And I went ahead and bought that instead because it actually saved me a ton of money on parts and installation. And I was confident that even though it was used, I was able to do the maintenance to maintain it over the long haul. Um, and I was willing to rebuild shocks and things like that if I had to. So that is one way to potentially get into a long travel system cheaper. Another thing to understand is this is an elite level of long travel. This really is for going really fast in the deserts and, and racing. Ironically, it does awesome in things like Moab on Hell's Revenge um, because it can just soak up some of those really big bumps and it's just a lot nicer, less back jarring ride. Um, so it can do a lot of different things, actually. It's a very capable suspension system. One thing I'll tell you, if you have no interest in spending $20,000 on long travel, there is cheaper long travel systems available. Um, you're going to see the major difference here is they're not going to have those triple bypass shocks. So it will have a long travel that will extend your upper and lower control arms to get you that further distance of travel, but it will only have, for example, a coil over in the front. You're gonna rely on your bump stops a lot more to actually dampen if you decide to jump that thing in the air or something like that, or hit an unexpected bump at high speed. So those systems are significantly cheaper. They're gonna be at about half the cost because you're not gonna to have to be adding in a second shock into there. You're not absorbing the cost of the triple bypass shocks. They're usually gonna offer a little bit less travel than what we just talked about and less control. That is not me talking bad about them. I mean, the reality is almost none of us even need long travel in the first place. This is definitely a splurge. So you need to be able to go in and choose your own adventure based on your budget. The other thing you really need to consider is weight. If you are going to do one of these overland builds, or I like to call them overloaded builds, where you are well above you know, your payload recommendations of your vehicle, 
and then you're going to try to slap a mid-grade long travel system in there, you really aren't going to get much out of it. Um, you're just going to overload those shocks and, and it's not going to be a good ride. So you really do need to plan your entire vehicle build if you're planning on doing long travel. You need to account for the weight, the weight fully loaded with all your gear. The last thing you want to do is spend ten or $20,000 on long travel and then just drive around a completely overloaded truck that offers you no ability to enjoy what you just invested in. So keep that in mind. When I was getting into long travel, I went all over the internet and I could not find a video that just dumbed down long travel, even the high-end systems, dumbed it down for a beginner to understand how deep down the rabbit hole do I have to go if I really want to have this on my truck. So that's what I was trying to make here. If you want a much more technical video, um, that could come later. When I was telling you, like, this is on a Tundra with leaf springs in the rear. The brand new Tundras don't have leaf springs in the rear. They're, they're sprung a different way. So you'd have a different type of long travel in the rear of the brand new Tundra. Or, for example, even the Raptors. They, they have a linked up kit in the back. But cost-wise, frankly, even though the components look a little different, on the rear end of those trucks. Cost-wise, you're gonna be in the same ballpark. So, I hope that this was helpful. This is just an entry-level crash course into long travel. That's what I was trying to accomplish with this. If you found this video helpful, please check out my other gear videos and maybe like or subscribe to the channel. That's very helpful. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you.